Megan, it's hard to believe it, but for plan ahead types like me, spring is right around the corner and that means warmer weather and more time on the go. Today, we're talking about the Vionic Vitals collection from our longtime sponsor, Vionic Shoes. These are the best essential styles for everyday wear to get you ready for the season. There's the Uptown Loafer, a super cute, chunky loafer that comes in 10 different colors and collapses flat for easy packing. And there's also the Chardonnay Heeled Sandal, which I just ordered a pair of in a bright cherry red. I don't wear heels a ton anymore, but when I do, they are always Vionic because they're just so comfortable. Yeah, and I was excited to see that the Willa Slip-On Flat is part of the Vitals collection because I have those in a bright blue and they are so much fun. Elevate your wardrobe with Vionic Vitals, a meticulously crafted collection with daily wear styles designed for comfort and versatility. And of course, the entire collection features Vionic's exclusive Viomotion technology, which is what makes their shoes so comfortable and supportive. The company actually got their start by revolutionizing medical orthotics. And then lucky us, they just continued that right into fashion footwear. They even offer a 30 day guarantee so you can wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code THEMOMHOUR15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one-time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us, and we're the hosts of The Mom Hour. On this show, we're joined by a team of unique mom voices from across the country and in different stages of motherhood to bring you tips, ideas, and encouragement, and to help you feel a little less alone. We all know that motherhood is a lot easier when real moms share honest truths and remind each other that it's all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to The Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 434 of The Mom Hour. I'm Megan Francis here with Sarah Powers. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Megan. How's it going? It's going well. Um, I'm excited today to talk about a perennial (laughs) topic, uh, one that never seems to go away, and I think one that we've addressed a few times on the show, but it's, it's time for a refresh, and that's chores and household responsibilities and how we delegate those to our kids, how we feel about those, like where we are with those in our current situations. Yep. I, yeah. I I have to share like a little mom hour behind the scenes memory is I think the very first we, we have an episode. It's like episode eight or 15 or something. I mean, so long ago, like eight and a half years ago was one of our first topics. And I have such a clear memory of just feeling um, like I wasn't doing a good job as a mom getting my kids to do chores. And I distinctly remember you telling me like, dude, you've got time. Um, And that was so long ago. So my kids would have been like three, five and seven, something like that. Like, and you know, the five and seven or six and eight, if they were, I certainly knew they were capable. Six and eight year olds are capable of doing stuff. And, and I do think it's a good idea to keep an eye on that, but I just was kind of overwhelmed at like where to start. And I just, I can like, go back in time and think how much I needed that encouragement from you in that moment. And you were like, they're not going to really be helpful till they're like 10 and 12. And even then you've got a lot of time. And so now I can sit here and I have a 15, a 13 and a 10 and a half, like coming closer to 11. And I have so much to say about this topic because I've got like, I've got serious chore doers in my house. And that's not to say it goes perfectly or that they don't complain. And there's no, I mean, but now is the time where like this makes material sense in my life. And I just, it it just didn't that it's kind of sweet to think back on. I, I love that. And I think that, you know, where I was in my life at that moment was, well, my little was still really little and your little is not so So little anymore, but but I had teenagers. So I was much more kind of like where you are now. And I think I was just seeing that this is a long, this is a long vision thing, right? We're in the, the, and it, it changes a ton. Um, it's changed for me with every transition I've gone through in our family lives with every kid who's, um, either, either left home or even just gotten busier, you know, things like teenagers getting jobs or, a 10 year old getting really into a sport will change the structure of what chores look like in your house. The house itself sometimes can dictate what it looks like. Yeah, um, definitely. Your preferences, how much free time you have to like either guide or not guide or like how much you need it done versus how much time you have to do the delegation. All of those things 
make this like a very fluid process. And I think it's more important that kids feel competent, like they can do stuff and know that they can figure it out. Yep. That's like the important part. I don't think the important part is that they know how to run your particular vacuum cleaner by yeah. a certain age. It's just that they know vacuum cleaners exist and that they have the capacity and the, cap the capability to figure out how to do it. And, and the, the feeling of shared responsibility yes. that it's some, it's their job too. Well, um, and that's the yeah. thing I was going to add. And then you added it at the end is I, I have been doing a little expert reading on this lately to kind of refresh my own mind. And that, um, that feeling like they are a valued and important part of a system and actually, uh, that their contributions, uh, matter, but also that in a deeper way that, that they matter and that there's a tangible way to show up for the people you care about, um, is really, really important. It turns out. And so I would say if I were giving advice to moms of younger kids, um, thinking about why chores matter to you at a kind of like higher level or values-based level is a, is a great mental exercise. Maybe talking about it with your co-parent or your partner, because like you said, Megan, the individual chart and the execution of said chores is probably not going to be super satisfying or tidy. No. It's going to, mm -hmm. it's going to involve power struggles. It's going to be messy. It's not going to go how you think it's going to go. And that could be really frustrating and disheartening. So for me, it's really helpful to come back to what you just said, which is like, what do I actually want? What's the long term line of sight? And then that helps me stick to it, actually, because I we're going to talk later about the traps we fall into. But I can be like an all or nothing thinker. So if a if if they're not keeping up with their chores or I'm not happy with the way they're doing them, I can want to throw in the towel completely. And I think having that bigger picture helps me stick with it. It's kind of like getting your kids to try new foods and things like that at the micro level, it's disheartening. So it, it yeah. helps to know why you're doing this thing. It does because, you know, there's not really a world in which your three or five or seven year old is actually going to lower your, um, workload yeah. in any, like in any way at all. Right. Um, no matter how much delegating you do, there's no much the amount of delegating or even honestly competence at, at, a, a three or five or seven year old level, that's really going to lower your workload. That's not what this is about. Yeah. It's a teaching yeah. and, and it does not end for a very long time ever. <laughs> it, does, it never ends. Um, <laughs> well, let's just check in with each other yeah. about current life. Maybe say how old your kids are. Remind everybody in case it's anybody's first time, what stage of life you're in and like at a very high level, how's it going with chores around the house and kids? Well, it's really interesting that we're doing this episode right now because I hadn't given it much thought. Um, we're, we're in the middle or I guess at the beginning, like the late beginning, the late beginning stages of a huge life transition where I'm going from a family, a much larger family in terms of kids. I'm now down to two teenagers in the house, Clara, who's 14 and Owen, who's 17. And I just got remarried. Uh, over the summer. So fewer kids mm -hmm. um, at this time, not last year. Well, no, last year, I guess Isaac was with us. And the year before that, Will was still at home. So like, really, we're down like two kids, but yeah. added another adult. Mm -hmm. And we moved into his former home. So he already had systems in place. He's very self-sufficient. Like he does more housework than I do. I think I, I don't pay attention or keep score, but like, it's, it's a very much a uh, equal partnership in that way. Um, so things are going almost a little too smoothly. And then I kind of realized as I was getting ready for this episode, I'm like, oh, it has nothing to do with my kids because I haven't quite figured out yet how to bring them into the workload meaningfully. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, there's just less to do. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's just yeah, you're running a smaller ship in. over there. Yeah. yeah, like fewer kids and and both of them are very like, um, they're neat kids. They're not the kind of, I've got some kids in my house who just leave stuff everywhere. And Claire and Owen really aren't like that. So there's just not a lot. They haven't added a lot more clutter or dishes or anything, but also there's another adult who's, you know, chipping in constantly and often very proactively. So he's kind of like cleaning behind everybody. And so I'm not seeing, you're not seeing the, I'm not the seeing gaps. the, exactly. And because we moved into his house where 
systems are already in place and he can be a little particular about some things. I haven't really felt that comfortable, I guess, um, saying, well, we're just going to, you know, take this part over or the kids are going to do this part from now on and you don't have to worry about it. Um, it just hasn't happened yet. Like they definitely still do kitchen chores. Like they still unload and load the dishwasher. They'll take the trash out when asked and Owens mowed the lawn when needed. And, and also they're with their dad every other week, which makes some of those ongoing chores a little tricky. Yeah. Like the lawn might need to be mowed when no yeah. kid is here to mow it. So that can kind of throw it off sometimes. So they're still doing stuff, but like we haven't quite figured out what this new thing is going to look like, even though both of them are very competent and capable. Um, they do their own laundry at this point. I will say okay. I have nothing to yeah. do with their laundry. And um, I know they can do it and I know they would if asked, but it's like, I haven't quite figured out how to structure it yet. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's a pickle or a, a, yeah. a it's twist. a lot. It's yes. also kind of, can I just be really honest? It's kind of nice. It's kind of a nice break. You have a supportive partner who's sharing the adult workload. Um, your kids are adjusting to a very different situation in a new house and not yes. that you were beating yourself up. I don't think you were, but like, it's also okay if it's just like, there's not no, as many chores right now. You've like, put in a lot of years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, right. Yes. And for a long time, like the kids were my, my work, my worker bees, like they had to be because we had a lot to get done and a lot of people and, uh, you know, and not another adult in the house. And now that's flipped and that's good for them. And I think that we're working on other routines, like other new ways of sort of being all together in a house and other yeah. structural things. And they're keeping things clean. They're doing their own laundry. They're helping with the dishes. I'm cool with it. I love that. Plus Owen is driving Clara yeah. all over the place. So that's I also, that. that also counts. <laughs> it all, it all counts. Yeah. Um, How about you? Well, I kind of feel like the opposite. I went full, like it's time to crack down around here this fall, which is probably why I was excited to talk about this topic again. Um, so again, my kids are 15, sophomore in high school, 13, eighth grade and 10, fifth grade. Um, I think over the last couple of years, we have gradually made a lot of progress in um, kids being capable and willing to help when asked and having a, a little bit of a better attitude. So I, on the one hand, I feel like we were at a good place with that. Everybody knew how to do um, basic jobs around the house. People were not like, melting onto the floor in yeah. like groaning oh, dramatically when yes. asked and that, that's a big step yeah, I'm just patting myself on the back like they all know how to take out the trash they know how to do the basic things around the house but I did get a little reinvigorated listening to a couple different um I guess experts podcast interviews books just reminded I've got three years left at home with the oldest um reminded of that the importance of chores almost as a, um, a piece of their overall wellness and mental health puzzle, that feeling connected to the family, that higher level stuff I was talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I had also realized was that, I, as often happens with me, I can treat my three kids as kind of, um, um, the same in their abilities. And which means that the oldest isn't doing quite enough. And the youngest is scrambling to keep up. It's simpler for me, but it isn't always age appropriate. So this fall, I got a little more granular and Brian and I actually got on the same page. We had a little, went for a walk and kind of like, I guess, touched base at a philosophical level and made a Google doc and looked at what they were already doing. And what we ended up doing is adding some more regular recurring required tasks to Luke's plate, who is 15, um, added a couple more to reads and didn't really add any to Violet. So we really are looking at it as really three different um, expectation levels this fall. And the other thing I did was <laughs> implemented a, a, a little bit of a an accountability system for the older two, which is that if they are not doing their regular jobs that I shouldn't have to remind them to do, I have a little jar of very small tasks that they can choose from to pick up an additional thing or two. Um, and so for my kids, that feels very punitive because I don't tend to, I don't tend to impose um, consequences or punishments or like take things away. It's just not, it's never really been our family's style, but I was pretty 
tired of reminding. And I also felt like at 13 and 15, part of their role is not needing to be reminded all the time. Um, and so, yeah, now they have a little jar. I made these little laminated things they can choose from. And they're really small, Megan. They're not meant to feel like super painful. It's just like, if I picked up your socks, you can do something for me. Like, let's, yeah. you know, let's just agree that um, I don't, an occasional reminder is not a big deal. Like, Hey, could you, you know, I, I, I saw you didn't do this, or could you be sure to do this before you leave for school? That feels very acceptable. Um, but the, the constant or the almost like a willful forgetting of the thing that you're supposed to do literally every day, every day you bring your cups and your water bottles out from your bedroom in the morning and load them in the dishwasher every single day. If I'm finding cups in your room, like you can, and I have to bring them out, then you can do something for me. So there's a little, a little light, um, accountability system in play. So I'm, I'm going to stop there because that was a lot and I'm happy to answer more granular questions, but that's where we've arrived this fall. Well, I think that the way you're putting, like, I think that punishment and consequences are one thing, but accountability and like, you know, learning that, um, some parts of life are a little transactional. Like sometimes you do get your back scratched because someone first scratched yours, right? Or no, wait, you scratch (laughs) it back because someone scratched yours or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And I've, I have not used that exactly like that as a system. Um, but there have been times when I've had to say like, wow, you know, to a kid who just is dragging their feet or doesn't want to get started, like, wow, I do a lot of stuff for you. And I don't go through this. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't throw myself on the floor and cry. Not that my kids are doing that anymore. But, you know, like, I don't do that when you need X, Y and Z. And it really doesn't feel great to be in that situation. And it's interesting, the kids of mine who respond to that gentle emotional manipulation <laughs> Because they don't see it as manipulation. They yeah. see it as truth. Yeah. And the ones who will push back, <clears throat> Owen, you yeah. know, um, and what my response has to be. So I guess my question for you about this would be, do you have a little lawyer in your house who wishes to fight back that perhaps the consequence is not fair? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A and B or like not equivalent or like whatever yeah. their line of reasoning is. B And then B, we've talked about this a little bit with things that aren't exactly about chores, but I have kids in my house who really benefit from reminders, prompting, whatever that looks like. And and I'm, and it's not like the, I, this is already the rule, but I'm still going to remind you every single day that you have to bring your cups out. I'm talking about more things like that, or maybe little one-offs or something where like some kind of prompting or reminding might be helpful. And then the kids who are annoyed by the prompting, because they're like, I would have gotten to it in the time frame you set, but now you like ruined it. No, yeah. because, because yeah. you reminded me, you yeah. like circumvented me from being able to be the one to deliver. And I'm just wondering how this system plays into that or if it, you know what I mean? Or yes. if you get any pushback. I do. That was like all, that was 17 different questions in one. So sorry about that. No, it's okay. I do. And I'm really transparent with the kids and I should say we, I'm saying I a lot, but Brian is on board and we really did roll this out together. And we were really transparent with the kids about why we were trying this and that it was an experiment um, and that their feedback is welcome, but also like not in the moment. Like if, if we're going to try this for a couple of weeks, a few weeks, here's why we're doing it. And here's why it's important. And here's why Violet's not actually on the, the, we call them the green jobs, which makes it sound like a climate initiative, but it's because um, they're like written in green in this little jar. So Violet's not on the green jobs plan because she's not, I don't have the same expectations for her. Um, but yes, to answer your question, uh, I have one litigator, especially in Reed, but both of them pushed back on like, okay, mom, it makes sense if you had to pick up our socks because we left them on the floor and now we're at school and you picked them up. That makes sense because you did that for us. Do you like my teenage voice? I remember when yeah. you used to do a teenage voice. Mine was more like that, that's right? <laughs> so that makes sense because like you Bro. had to do that for us. So now we do something for you. But why do I still have to pick up my socks if you catch me and then I also have to do a green job? (laughs) And I pretty much say, well, because Because. this is my world. And also a little pain, a little bit of like an ooh, ouch. I didn't want to also have to go um, vacuum the back hallway for two seconds. Um, That is part of what helps you remember next time. So a a little itty bitty, um, 
I guess, like negative reinforcement or a co- like what would happen at school if you didn't turn your paper in or you didn't put your name on your paper, something happens. And so right. anyway, my yes, my kids are very um, like consequence and punishment sensitive. I've made them that way. And we could dig into that another time. But um, I just said that's this is what we're trying. So, yeah, that feels unfair to you. I hear you. And that's how it's going to be for right now. So they they don't like that, that sometimes sometimes it's a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type of thing. But sometimes it's actually no, you still have to do the thing you forgot to do. And now you can help me out with this other thing as a little. Well, like, it's like you forgot to scratch my back. So now you still have to scratch my back and you have to add in like pay 50 a, cents whatever. and you have to pay 50 yeah. cents. Yeah. And this is me like <laughs> totally owning the fact that I I'm not sure if this is the right way. I don't know if this is going to work. This is the experiment we're trying in real time now. And um, I'm I welcome their litigation attempts and I don't like I don't go in hard on that power struggle. I listen. Um, and I acknowledge that, you know, this is something we're trying for right now, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let them get away with it. Yeah. That makes sense. Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product. The algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh, minty essence in every bottle, so you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. Sarah, have you seen the new collection from our sponsor, Vionic? It's called Vionic Vitals, and it offers some of Vionic's best essential styles for everyday wear to help you get ready for the spring, which is not that far off, by the way. The Willa Slip On Flat is in the Vitals collection, and I have to say, I have a pair of Willas, and they are one of my favorites. The shoe has classic and classy loafer styling with a seriously supportive footbed, and they come in over 12 colors to complement any outfit. I've also got a pair of Vionic's Uptown loafers on the way, which I'm really excited about because they collapse flat for packing. I'll definitely get a ton of use out of those when I'm traveling this spring. I know, and that feature is so smart. Well, Megan, I am also very excited about the Vionic Vitals collection. These are versatile daily wear styles that feel as good as they look. Yeah, and let's talk about that comfort, Sarah. Vionic actually got started by revolutionizing medical orthotics. Today, they continue to use that science to engineer shoes that are super cute and also feel great on your feet. Vionic even offers a 30-day guarantee. Wear your shoes, love them, or return for a full refund within 30 days. Use code themomhour15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's one-time use only. Vionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. I'm curious. Our personalities are so different, Megan. And now we've yeah. been doing this parenting gig for a long time. So I can definitely think of the, the kind of traps I fall into as a mom because of my personality or how I like to run my home. And I bet you have some too. So let's talk about like, I guess, what obstacles get in the way of us being the chore mothers that we aspire to be. Well, the first one that I didn't even have on this list, but came to mind when you were talking about your new deal in your house, green jobs, uh, the green jobs initiative, yes, <laughs> was the fact that Violet is exempt. And um, in my house, that has created the idea that Clara does not have the same responsibilities as Owen. And Owen truly believes that her load is less than it ever was for him. Like, I think he believes he was doing chores at the age of four right. that Clara will literally never have to do. Sure. And a lot of that is just kind of like the sort of colorful memory making, I guess, that kids have. Yeah. It's, it's very subjective, right? And they believe that things are and were a certain way. And um, 
And sometimes I feel like where that can play into my personality is that I second guess whether I'm favoring the youngest because they're the youngest. I don't want to be unfair. I don't want my kids to be mad at me or to feel like they're too burdened. I want them to all be cheerful and happy and enjoy the work I'm giving them to do. And even the way I ask them to do chores has always been just like so cheerful and polite and like, gosh, could you do this and that? And I know sometimes that can sound like I'm not real serious and it's some kids don't respond to that. So um, me being the youngest and someone who wants to lead with like love and um, flexibility and giving everyone emotional buy-in without like, you want them to want, I want them to want to do it. And I also want to give them so much space to figure it out. Yeah. And sometimes it, sometimes that just doesn't work. Sometimes like I have to, mm, it can't just be because I want them to want to be on board. Sometimes they're just not going to want to want to. And sometimes their version of reality is just not real. It's just not accurate. And I have to stand firm in that, which isn't always easy. Um, another trap I sometimes fall into, especially over the years when the kids were really little delegating to them. And I used to use the Downton Abbey, like Mrs. Hughes, um, metaphor. Like I was basically a household manager and I was delegating as needed. I was not, if my kids did not have chore charts that they had to do every day, it was like, here's what I need to have done. Troops come in, you do this, you do this, you do this. And that worked really, really well when there was a lot to be done. What I have found is that I sometimes then when the need is less or when I'm enjoying aspects of work, I kind of hoard it or forget to delegate it or don't want to bother. So sometimes, okay, like right now I'm nesting, I'm in a new home. I don't really want them in up in my stuff right now because I'm doing it. And again, it's not like, I don't feel like this is that problematic. It's a, it's a, it's a brief and temporary situation. But I have to like remind myself like, oh, I they need to be doing work just for the sake of them needing to be doing work right. for character building, life learning, all of those things that we were talking about. I can't only call on them as needed because sometimes I just don't need them that much. And then that starts to create, I think, a splintering. They they know that I'm not asking them to do as much. They start drifting away and like having their own little universes that they're living in. And I don't want that to happen. So that's just something I'm. um recognizing yeah. about myself. Well, I already mentioned having another adult in the house. Um, and it's just not evident what needs to be done. Um, and I think another limitation I have, I won't even call this a trap or like a, a personality struggle exactly, but inside the home has always been my domain. And I don't know a whole lot about the workings of outside a home. Like I don't know a whole lot about how to keep the landscaping nice or how to like do things to the car. I know how to check my oil and fill a tire with air. That's about it. So it's been really helpful to remember that my kids as, you know, Owen's a driver. um, There are responsibilities that I don't, not only do I not know how to teach him, but I don't even know that he should learn them. Yeah. So that's been one place that Eric's been really helpful to stepping in with all my kids. Like, I think he showed all my kids at one point, you know, years ago, how to put gas in a lawnmower and how to use it. I was hiring that out because I didn't know how to teach my own kids how to mow the lawn. That's like a huge limitation that I realized as a newly divorced person. It was like, oh, I don't really know how to do this. It sounds very gendered. And I suppose it it probably is the way the reason it fell that way and my marriage, but here I still am at the age was at the age of 40 going, well, what do I do now? I don't particularly want to take up lawn mowing at 40 just so I can teach my kids how to do it. So it's been really helpful to have Eric who understands a totally different realm of household work, cleaning gutters, all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. that um, is part of it. Right. And I just didn't, I was limited by my lack of knowledge there. Um, So that's something where I have to stand back and be like, I don't even know what I don't know. Yeah. So you just take, take it. And he's happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess the last one I would say is that the two kid dynamic is different and Clara and Owen get along great, but there being just two of them, it's like they have to play all of the roles in just two people. (laughs) 
<laughs> like in a family of four or five people, you might have your cut up your clown. Right. You know, you might have your um, the stickler, the rule follower. You, you have the baby. You have all those things. And now it's like they're both trying to be all of it somehow. And it's been very interesting to navigate. And it can be things like, oh, and digging in on fairness while Clara just complains about having too much to do. It, right. it can it can look like a lot of different things. It's like concentrated. They've both become concentrated versions of themselves. Yeah. And um, I'm just kind of figuring that out. Yeah. Yeah. And you are an empath and you do care about like how how they feel about these chores. And so I would imagine it feels even more concentrated because there are only two of them. It's like, right. This is a lot of yeah. a lot of feelings. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, what about you? So the first trap I already mentioned, but I'll just touch on it again. And and that is, I have three kids relatively close in age. And un, unlike you were talking about the temptation to let the baby off the hook. I actually think in my family, it's played out the opposite, which is Violet's really um, resourceful and capable and eager to um, play up and be older. So often by the time I realize she's ready for a set of responsibilities, I realize that I have not given the older ones as much responsibility as even I'm expecting of Violet. So I actually have to do the opposite, which is like, she's still 10 she's still learning and it's actually um, the older ones who've gotten away with probably like a younger kid's version of chores for longer. And that's where I talked about kind of playing a little bit of catch up this fall with my middle and high schooler. Um, Along the same lines with the teenagers, I listened to this interview with a psychologist named Wendy Mogul uh, a couple of months ago, and she made a point that I keep thinking about, which is with um, responsible, high achieving kids, especially. And in, and if you live in an area where parenting culture is very focused on achievement, um, there's this temptation for parents to let kids off the hook because they have homework or because they're excelling in their sport. Um, so instead of thinking like, oh man, my teenager's loafing around all day and he needs some chores. Well, that, like, we think that makes logical sense. But what we forget, and I'm speaking generally, this was the, the person I was listening to, but I can see this trap in myself, is a kid who's busy with theater and in honors classes and having lots of homework and doing so, like doing really well in all of their quote unquote traditionally uh, like uh, achievement oriented life areas. Yeah. Then you think, well, I'm not going to also like have them drag the garbage bins back because they've been at school and rehearsal for six hours, like poor kid doing so well at being 15. You know what I mean? Like right. I can really see how that mindset gets. I also can see how that happened a bit when I was a teenager. Cause I was a high achieving, busy teenager. And I think I was let off the hook in some chores areas, which no big deal. Like I turned out. Okay. So I, uh, that is a trap I'm keenly aware of right now with my 15 year old, especially that he actually need he needs to be held accountable for also being a part of a household system and actually leaving the nest knowing how to be a good roommate and knowing how to be a compassionate family member is equally or more important to me than knowing he can, you know, carry a course load of four classes and be in three productions at theater. Like it's it's just equally important but it's it's a trap that I I can easily see how we fall into. I think that's so interesting because Owen argues that on his own behalf. I did too he's, when I was a teenager. He is by far the most um, academically successful of any of my kids. And he's very aware of it, like so far. <laughs> and he literally has this attitude like, well, what else do you want from me? Right. Do you see all these A's? I'm, do you see that I have like a 4.4 in this weighted class? Like, come on. You really expect me to do that too? And I'm like, yeah, because I don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> just like. Good for you. That's great. Good for you. But also, yes. Mm -hmm. And also, he's got time because school's easy for him. It doesn't take him any longer to make a bunch of A's as it might take another kid in the same family to maybe pull off B's. Like it doesn't take it doesn't take him more time. And I really bristle at that actually when he tries to play that with me. Like it I actually kind of um react very unfavorably and, and maybe unfairly to it and, and then kind of blow it off like, well, whatever, that's on you if you want to do well in school, but I need you to load the dishwasher or whatever yeah. it is. Um, 
it's just interesting how kids, well, we all just see the world differently. Yeah. And he's gotten messages, however he's gotten them, that doing well in school is his job. Mm-hmm. And it's his one and only job. And, and I have to remind him that actually life, there's more to it than that. Well, and, and just to like parrot the psychologist I listened to, it's really, <laughs> it's, it's dicey for kids to go out in the world believing that their value is performance based and achievement based. There's a lot that a lot of trouble that that can bring up later on in life for them. So it's it's actually really good for them to know. And I'm not lecturing you about Owen specifically, but like I think we want them to feel like part of their value is as a contributing member of a society or a system or I mean in this case we're talking about a family unit. So um yeah, it's actually the opposite. Like it, it, we, we, I don't think we want our kids believing that that's their only, the only way that they can be of value because at some point school gets harder or jobs get harder to get. And then, and then we want them to have that feeling like they're still worth something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I totally agree. And we could probably have a, a another whole episode about the up, like academic success and what that looks like and how we sort of tamper um, our own or temper. I'm not sure which word I'm looking for here, but like our own expectations around that. And then sometimes how they clash with our kids' expectations and the messages they're getting yeah. from other areas of their world. And it's very interesting. It's been really interesting having so many kids to see how they all felt so differently about it. And knowing that I knowing how I feel about it and what that I've brought the same attitude to all five of them thinking, okay, so then where it's not all coming from me is what I'm getting at. (laughs) There's a lot of messages that are happening around kids about what success looks like and what's important in life. And um, we're only a part of that conversation. That's true. And I think, yeah, I think, so I think the more grounding we can be about it, the better at home because we're fighting against a lot of other influences. I agree. I agree. Okay. Well, that was a, a big long trap that I think is more of a systemic trap, but it's one that I felt myself when when I heard it, I thought, Oh, I can very much see that playing out, but I'm kind of at the early end of high school. So I I felt like that was a good one to catch, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll mention a couple other quicker traps that I can fall into. Um, one is that if you have, or if, if one has a child going through a particularly grouchy phase, and I don't mean one afternoon, I mean, a season of life. Let's just take, for example, sounds like perhaps you are speaking from um, from experience. Let's take, for example, the 13 year old boy Um, seen in the wild. You've seen a few of these. Um, I can fall into the trap of not wanting to poke the bear or not wanting to make a grouchy kid grouchier. And it's, it happens at such a micro level. I'm not likely to let a kid get off scot-free, like not clear their plate after dinner or something. But let's say they did a really um, very marginal job at something that they know how to do and they just phoned it in. And I mean phoned it in hard or are phoning it in consistently. I can fall into the trap of just not wanting to get into a argument or not wanting to make a sad kid sadder. And so that's that like, <laughs> that's a little codependency happening that I just check my check myself and try to be sort of cheerfully non-attached. Whatever we have agreed upon is your job. And the, the terms of the agreement, they, they stand even when you're having a bad day. Um, and of course, like, are there exceptions to that at the extremes? Of course, I'm not going to tell a kid to take out the trash if they're in the middle of a true meltdown, but you see where like the slippery slope happens. Like I find myself avoiding the, the dark and stormy kid for all of their accountability. And then that wouldn't be, that would serve no one either. Right. Yeah. 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 I could see how that could be a trap that um, could mean one kid would get away with not doing anything yeah. and, and actually kind of encourages an outward uh, display of grumpiness yep. because it pays off. Yep. Totally. Um, and then the last one is not a trap, but um, it's just a, it is a, challenge in the makeup of our family. And that is that Brian, my husband is so helpful and so generous and so loving to our shared children that 
I think he and I have different expectations or different um, priorities when it comes to the kids and their jobs. And that has been a point of tension between us. And I think we're now very open about it. And I do think we understand each other a little bit better. But what feels to him like being a nice dad looks to me like undermining what we've said is important in our family. And I can get very triggered or very irritated um, when when it's something the kid's supposed to be doing that I just see Brian doing right right in front of my eyes instead of asking that kid or following up with that kid or holding that kid accountable. So I'm just that is that has been an ongoing struggle for us. And I think it's getting better, but it is a it's not a trap. It's just it's just the way we're wired and and yeah. how we have to co-parent. I mean, I'm 100 percent Brian. I know. In situation. I know. I have to. I, I don't want you to take that like I'm criticizing no, I don't. you. It's just like, the yeah. Yeah, I and I could see how the rule following, um, like the side of you that says, but we made the rule for a reason. And then it's like flouting. And then there's me going, but I just, I just want to be nice though. And I can do it. Why not? Why wouldn't I just jump in and do it? And I, you know, it's not the same with a step parent, but Eric's definitely more of like a, let's set a rule. And then everyone follows the rule. Whereas I sort of resist systems and feel yeah. like people can just in the moment figure like into it, what needs to get done and why do we have to have a rule or a system for everything? So we're not butting heads or anything. And they're my kids. And I, I think he doesn't want to, um, overstep, yeah. but at some point we'll have to figure out what this is going to look like. His tendency is to want to know what is the rule going to be? Cause then he knows if everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. That's so me. And yeah. I'm like, well, if everything's just running well, what does it matter? Right. If everyone's pitching in and like things are getting done, who cares? And so that's a very different way of looking at the world. And, yeah. and so there's been some, like, I'll get irritated even when he just says like, so what's the rule going to be? I'm like, there's no rule. <laughs> we don't have a rule for that. Cause I don't want to think about it. I don't feel like making one. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see how that shapes up in the future. Um, maybe all the kids will be grown and gone before before it like actually gets figured out yeah. but I can see the relief I mean we finally did settle on the fact that like the way it's going to look when my kids are here is different from the way it's going to look when they're not and so basically um like when I used to hang out here before we all moved in the and I'm using r rules kind of when there's just two adults who are both pitching in it's not rules yeah, systems, we didn't have rules but systems for expectations but systems. yeah yeah so the systems were just basically we picked up after ourselves in the moment. So like we just did our dishes while they accumulated, like they just didn't pile up in the sink. Cause after you had a bowl of, you know, yogurt, you'd go wash out the bowl. And that works really well for two people. I think it's very inefficient for four, especially when there are pots and pans and things. Yeah. And I, so finally the rule, the rule has kind of become, we do it the old way when it's just him and me. And when my kids are here every other week, we do it a new way, which is sort of my emerging way, yeah. which involves the dishwasher. And I think there was some relief for him just to know that, just to have that much structure around it. Like, okay, now I know. So I won't hover in the kitchen yeah. wondering why your kids aren't hand washing their dishes after they have a plate of something. I'll just trust that at the end of the day, the dishwasher will get run. And it's been working really well. But that's just one little thing. That's just I mean, one little area of the house. It, like you've opened up an entire like Enneagram one deep dive there. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. I like have so much compassion for both you and Eric. It's like as that same personality type, it's not that I can't let go of expectations or rules or systems, but just a, li a little bit goes a long way in allowing that person to it's almost like be off the clock somehow. Now we know like we're not really on the clock. We're not, it's not our job to make sure everything is done right all the time, but that comes hardwired in us. So yes, knowing like a little bit of what the system is can go a long way in feeling like we can set that part of ourselves down. Yeah. And I think for me, it was like, how about how about in the kitchen when my kids are here, the kitchen just isn't your problem, really. Like, yeah. we'll figure it out Even in that, like, yeah. a while. But it's not, you don't have to worry about it. It's not for you. It's not for you. Get out. And I could see him, like, making a big effort to not, just to kind of physically remove himself, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know if he's comfortable with it, but there hasn't been as, there hasn't been conflict 
and things are happening and are getting done. And I think there's relief for both of us in that, like that things are happening. They are getting done. And then on the weeks that the kids leave, the nice thing is I'm very whatever about it. I don't care when they're not here. Yeah. As long as I don't have to have the job of mom, then I don't care because I'm off the clock. So we both get to check out yeah. every other week, actually, yeah. which is kind of nice. We are welcoming a new sponsor today, Dr. Mom Butt Balm. Sarah, this might sound a little weird, but when my kids were babies, I actually really enjoyed changing diapers. It felt like a little time out to connect. Oh, yeah, Megan. I can totally remember that feeling of just kind of leaning in and enjoying a little moment in your routine. Yeah, but when my babies had diaper rash, it made the whole experience so much less fun for both of us. And back in those days, we didn't have great options for rash cream either. It was usually goopy, heavy, and full of dyes and preservatives and other things I didn't really want to put on my baby's butt. Well, the creator of Dr. Mom Butt Balm, who is a mom and also a doctor, had the same experience, Megan, and she did something about it. Dr. Mom Butt Balm is free of dyes, preservatives, and zinc oxide. It's easy to apply, easy to remove, and you don't have to use a lot to protect your baby's skin. I really love the way this balm feels. It's almost like a high-end skin cream. Very nice, no strong scent, and definitely nothing like the diaper rash creams I used to struggle with. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician approved, super powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, Megan, we have not actually, I don't think, mentioned very many actual jobs our kids are doing yet. And I'm picturing moms of younger kids being like, okay, but how do you decide what to even, what do you even assign a kid? And since I just went through this exercise this summer, um, I'm happy to share like my approach. Um, as my kids have gotten older, it literally starts with the tasks I am doing or Brian is doing that somebody else is capable of, or almost capable of could be capable of. And I think that's, that's a, key point because often they're capable of much more than we give them credit for. As we've said many times on the show, you go into a Montessori classroom or a kindergarten classroom and all of a sudden you see a bunch of kids doing things that they have never done in your house, like washing dishes and, um, like, you know, hanging their things up. So, um, I, it's hard to impose someone else's list of jobs and chores onto your household because every household is different. But I bet that if you kind of, um, observed your own patterns within your house, things like taking out the trash, taking out the recycling or compost, um, feeding pets, uh, wiping up counters or tables, um, not even, not even regular laundry, but things like folding linens, um, sweeping or vacuuming in our kitchen gadgets episode. I think that was just last week or two weeks ago. Maybe I talked about the, our cordless vacuum and how a very young child can run that thing just enough to get pet hair and dust bunnies. So I, I think the approach I would recommend is literally observe yourself and your spouse or the other adults in your house and almost make like a little list on the side for a couple of weeks of things that you are doing regularly that someone else could, that one of your kids could do. And that does not mean you have to assign all of them out. I think we get to keep the jobs. Nobody wipes the counters in my, I wipe the counters because I really like to wipe the counters my way. 
but um kids take out the trash and kids um take care of different parts of our yard like picking up dog poop and picking avocados from the tree kids drag bins out um on the night before trash day and drag them back um they take care of pets that they own. I mean, animals are another great way to start little kids on chores. So anyway, I wonder, Megan, if you, I know you've said you just kind of look around and see what needs to be done, but do you remember back when your kids were smaller, like getting over that hump of like, oh, wait, I need help with this and I don't have to be the only one doing it? Well, I think it it's often just the, the tasks, like you already said, that you're already doing day to day anyway they're the things you're modeling doing they're the things that aren't usually pretty easy to do um and that aren't gonna be disastrous if they don't get done right yeah i don't really want a four-year-old cleaning the gutters um but like a four-year-old can yeah can like run a little stick a little stick vacuum and get dog hair and dead flies out of a windowsill yeah. is that a thing in california do you get dead flies accumulating in your windowsills yes mm-hmm. okay like in the it's not even the windowsill. It's the like tracks. the little the in tracks. The tracks of the, yeah, mm-hmm. we <laughs> <Yes>. sure do. <laughs> that I actually remember delighting when I finally figured out that my kids were capable and were able to take, you know, um, direction in that way. I kind of would delight in looking around for things that ke- I kept not getting to, but that they would actually find yes, kind of fun. I'm, I'm glad you said that because a- after I said, look at the things you're doing regularly, I thought, oh, but also look at the things that you wish you were doing regularly right. and you're not. Yeah. So like things like getting cobwebs out of the ceiling, you know, like the corners and the ceilings and like, yeah, wiping down um, the tracks and the windowsills, getting smears off of windows with the right tools, surprisingly young kids can do an okay job at stuff that you're not doing at all. <laughs> So like you may as well um, delegate it. I also think, you know, you mentioned Sarah and when uh, a little while ago that in your house, you noticed this imbalance, like the older kids had never been given like the most challenging stuff. And it was almost like, yeah, Violet was getting like really challenging stuff. I think that just kind of happens because when you're oldest, it's like how you didn't think um, you wouldn't have thought Luke was ready for the same TV as Violet. Right. At the age of 10, but yeah. whoop, there, here we are, right? <laughs> here we are. There we are. And I think younger kids learn by watching their siblings yeah. what they're capable of too. And it doesn't occur to you when your oldest kid is six, they seem like they're two compared to your youngest kid at six. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So it's like what they're capable of. It, it just takes a while to figure all that out. And I definitely look back at like Jacob and Isaac when they were in high school, I was rather uninspired about the stuff I asked him to do. It yeah. was kind of just like the, the basic list you already rattled off. And it was probably what you really needed, needed help with. You weren't going to get creative beyond that. No, I didn't have any capacity at that time. I had a whole bunch of little kids and, and I was just trying to keep things going. So I, I tended to start with either what was easiest to delegate, um, or what I really needed done. Another thing I want to add is that I, I feel like people have this impression like chores rotate in a lot of families like whose night it's a very like storybook like cartoonish way to think about it like whose night is it to clear the table or um I don't know if it's just the families around me or the way that it's worked out in my family but we don't have we we have played with rotating chores very very little bit and it almost never has gone well and I think it was in KJ Delantonia's parenting book a few years ago that she did a chapter on chores and talked about uh, maybe it wasn't even her, but someone she interviewed that chores were assigned for a whole year in, in their yeah, family. Ta- I feel like we talked about that I on the we, show. I think we've talked yeah. about it on the show. So I, I didn't adopt that like to a T, but I've just never spent very much energy trying to come up with systems that rotate. Instead, I have looked at ability and what do I need help with and what is this kid ready for? And then given them a job that's, that's basically theirs for a while, like until further notice, I guess. Yeah. Um, Luke right now is doing a tidy of the kids' bathroom every weekend. It's not a deep clean. He's not doing like the drains and the toilet, but a but like a clean the bathroom, a clean the bathroom light every weekend. Um, Reed and Violet haven't done that ever yet. And eventually I'll teach them how to clean a bathroom, but right now it's just with Luke. Um, Reed this year, I gave the job of un 
packing and breaking down any large deliveries. And I can't tell you how much joy this gives me. That is like the best thing to give kids to do. First of all, they actually kind of enjoy it. Well, remember, see also 13 year old boy. He's not going to enjoy it. Right. But we get some big ones. We get uh, we get a lot of our pet stuff delivered. So it'll be a big thing of guinea pig food. Hey, cat litter. Sometimes it's heavy comes with a lot of like awkward packing materials. And so if it's a little Amazon envelope or something, I don't, who cares? But the bigger deliveries is Reed's job. And that will be his job at least for a year. And it's, I think the kids really eventually come to appreciate having mastery over a skill and they become like, they almost are given the ability to come up with their own, like you were talking about earlier to figure out their own systems for it, which I think is really good. Violet unloads the farm box every week and um, puts all the farm stuff away and then folds up the box. And then we have to put the empty box out the next week because our CSA is like a delivery. And so she does that all on her own. And it's great. So that's just another I guess if you are at home thinking there has to be some kind of fair rotation, we are not rotating in in my house. And the fairness is more about age and ability, not like whose turn is it to, you know, feed the dog. I feel like a long time ago. I tried the rotation thing. And what I quickly realized is that you as a mother are creating another job for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you have multiple chores that are being rotated through, because now it's up to you to make sure that they get done and whose job it was to do them. The kids, they will look for any loophole to not do something. And, Oh, last night was my night, but then or his night, but I did it for him. And so tonight's not my night. And actually he said that if I did it last night, that I would, he would pay me back by doing this other thing too. And then you've got these kids like squabbling and I'm like, what is even just, can someone please just do this? Why so much drama? So I do not do any rotating. The only thing we rotate is the loading and unloading of the dishwasher because Clara and Owen are both convinced that I believe unloading they're convinced is the worst job in the whole way. No, maybe it's loading. I would rather load than unload. Um, so I get it, but it really, in the end, does it matter? And so I'm like, okay, fine. You guys can fight that out. I'm not going to get involved. Here's what I'm saying. Both have to be done. And there's only two of you. So if one doesn't get done, I'll know who didn't do their job. Like that feels a little more manageable to me than if I had like a long list of things and everyone was rotating through with like a check mark or something that makes me It's like when um, it's like when you try to get kids to share screen time Mm -hmm. um, and like then they argue over who actually got a larger share of the screen time. It's the kind of thing that makes my shoulders creep up toward my ears. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I think if it if there's something they can figure out between them um, that requires zero momness, then great. Maybe that's the solution. But no, it has very rarely worked. We we were trying to rotate with dragging the garbage bins out and back for a while. And there was this whole complicated thing where Reed is afraid of spiders and like really like legitimately afraid. And there's often spiders. And so there was like, yeah, just like you were saying, they were covering for him and he was picking up dog poop. And finally I was like, okay, it sounds like Reed always wants to pick up dog poop and you guys always want to do the bins. And that was what we landed on. That's that. That's that. Um, do you have any superpowers when it comes to kids and chores, things that your personality is particularly well suited for that have worked really well in your house? Since we've already talked about the, the ways we sabotage the our own, own intentions. Yeah. Well, I think we've kind of danced around this a little bit, but while I do want my kids, I want to lead with emotion. Like I want yeah. the buy-in, but I'm actually quite unemotional about the ask. Like I'm pretty no nonsense about it. I don't get upset if my kids don't want to do something. Um, I'm pretty good at being like, yeah, I get it. You don't want to, but here's the thing. I need you to. And my kids will actually laugh amongst themselves. Um, a little bit different, but this morning, Clara wasn't feeling very well before school. And she really was bargaining hard not to go. And, you know, she's a teenage girl. I know there's things that happen monthly that are really rough. And I was like, I'm willing to give her the time off if I feel like she really wants it. But I also know that sometimes getting out of bed is the hardest part. Right. So I was like, okay, well, I'll think about it, but I really want you to come down. And I already made you your little coffee and Eric made you breakfast. I really want you to come eat it and see if it helps you. So she came down and ate it. And then I said, so we're all sitting around the table. And I was like, 
So you're feeling better, huh? And Owen's like, I knew it. He goes, oldest trick in the book. She got you to the table. So they're like kind of making fun because they know me. They know yeah. my, they yeah. know my angle. Yeah. Um, they know that if they walk in a room and I'm standing there looking around, I'm probably going to give them something to do, but I'm going to do it like with a smile on my face and I'm going to do it in a way that like, if they really, really want out or like they have a really legitimate reason for not doing something, I'm probably going to let them off the hook. Yeah. So it's like benevolent. Uh, I'm like a benevolent dictator. Yeah. Yeah. With a big smile on my face. And I feel like that has been for me a superpower, whether my kids agree or not, I couldn't tell you. Um, but it keeps me in a good mood about it. Yeah. And that's, that is important because yeah. you're going to be doing this job for a long time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It yeah. has to be, it has to be palatable to you. I think that's right. probably the takeaway for any implementation of chores is like, as the household manager leader, you have to be able to, I mean, maybe you won't enjoy every minute, but right. it, it, it's not sustainable otherwise. Yeah. Um, I think for me, I'm, I'm very fair minded back to the Enneagram one. Like I will, I really, um, do listen to my kids if they have another idea for how to do things. And I am systems oriented, but I'm not like the system is going to rule no matter what. Um, so I think I make a, for a pretty fair negotiator, um, when it comes to deciding what's expected, when it can be done, um, that goes back to that trap of like that, that can be a slippery slope to letting a busy kid or a high achieving kid weasel out of stuff like we were talking Mm. about. But, um, so I am fair and I, I think I do listen and I'm willing to adjust. Um, and I, I like to teach, I like, I really enjoy the part of parenting that's teaching kids how to do something well and seeing them do it. Like that's the, I probably should have been a teacher or something. Um, so that part, I'm not sure it's a superpower and I don't think my kids care, but I guess it's something I enjoy. Like I genuinely enjoy when it's time for a kid to level up. Um, and I can sort of fairly hold their hand until they don't need hand holding anymore. And to me, that's really satisfying. I guess I, I don't think it's fun for the kids. Like no one really wants to be taught how to clean a bathroom well, but I enjoy it. So maybe yeah. that's the part well, that, that is like, I think that is a superhero or a superpower because delighting in something that's a big part of the job. That's the mentoring is important. Yeah. Um, enjoying it. Otherwise you'll just want to put it off and not, not ever do it. So Yeah. Well, this kind of brings us right back to where I started, which is I'm thinking about all of the newer moms and how much I needed to hear that it was not too late for me to start thinking about chores and responsibilities and that I had a lot of time. And now, actually, I still feel like I have a lot of time and I don't even have that much time. So that's what that's where I would close if I were, you know, going to give any advice to moms of younger kids is take a few things you heard from this episode or that you read online, print off a chore chart, and then give yourself a huge pass because you likely have a lot longer than you think to find your, find your own rhythm and style with this. Yeah. And, and I, I guess I would just add to that, that I think it's really important to keep our expectations in check, um, along the way. Like, I don't think giving your kids work to do is actually going to make your life easier for a long time. That's just not what it's yeah, necessarily you told, about. You told me beginning. 10 and 12. That's what you t- yeah, <laughs> told yes, me. <laughs> that, yes. And they're not going to know how to do things right until they're like 30. Right. <laughs> until it matters to them to do it right. That's just, and they're not going to care until they care. And you can't make them care more than they care. So it's kind of like making it work for you. However, it has to work with your, your particular unique, makeup of personalities and your life circumstances. I am still teaching my adult people how to do things correctly. Sometimes like I didn't know how to do a lot of things right when I was in my twenties. Oh my gosh. I have more than one. I can think I'm not going to tell them cause we're out of time, but I can think of three offhand anecdotes from when I was between 25 and 30, when I had was married, owned a home and had a baby where I was deeply embarrassed by something I like that either that got pointed out to me by a loved one or that I just realized I was not doing that I should or not doing well. And, or, or maybe I knew I should do it, but I just was, didn't, didn't have time. So yeah, um, this is literally lifelong. I'm so much better at 
these things at 43 than I was even at 33. So I think that's, that's such a good reminder that like, we're not trying to launch 18 year olds who are perfect at this stuff. We're, we're really more trying to make the kids a part of the household system in a, in a more loosey goosey kind of way, not in a perfection oriented way. If you ask me right now to go start up a lawnmower, I am not a hundred percent sure I could do it. Oh, I, I'm a hundred percent sure I couldn't. So there you go. <laughs> we there. still, we're still learning. We solved it. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the mom hour. Everything we talked about in today's episode is available at the And Hey, while you're there, you can find more than 500 podcast episodes, plus articles, playlists, and resources about motherhood and parenting at every stage. And if you like today's episode, we'd love it if you would take a minute to share the show with another mom in your life. You can also find us on Instagram at the mom hour, chatting and interacting with listeners between episodes. Thanks for being here, friends. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, everyone, we have a favor to ask. If you are an Apple Podcasts user, can you check really quickly to make sure you're still following the mom hour? Apple did one of their big software updates recently, and it changed a bunch of things about how you get the podcasts you're subscribed to. If Apple Podcasts is your podcast app of choice, all you have to do is find your way to our show page and then click the little plus sign or follow in the top right corner. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Megan here. Sarah and I would absolutely love it if you would hit pause right now, like right where you're listening, and leave the Mom Hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, this is one of the biggest ways you can thank us, and it really only takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts, you can navigate to the Mom Hour's show listing. So when you're in the episode you're listening to right now, click where it says the Mom Hour just above the play button and then scroll all the way to the bottom and you will see the ratings and reviews. We would love if you would leave us one as well. Thank you so much for listening.